We continue the session from chapter 3, verse 20 onwards. The verse 20 reads, Janak and others reached total accomplishment through action alone, even looking at the needs of gathering worldly success, you ought to act. I think I will just continue reading the next couple of verses as well because they are along the same lines. 21 to 24. In whatever way the senior most one conducts himself, that very way the other people follow. Whatever authority he establishes, the world conducts itself accordingly. O son of Pritha, in all the three worlds I have nothing that is yet to be done, nothing not attained or yet to be attained. Yet I indeed continue in action. If I were perchance not to continue in action without lassitude, O son of Pritha, and since all human beings follow my path in every way, all these worlds would perish if I were not to perform action. I would be the cause of disorder and would kill all these beings. So we go back to verse 20. To refer here to Janaka. Janaka is a legendary king. Many stories about him. And the reason he is such a great legendary king is that he is a sage king. He's an enlightened king. Not enlightened in the sense of progressive, but enlightened in the sense of truly a wise and a great king who has attained the highest state of Sakshatkar. So, here is a person who has accomplished. He still continues to do his duties as a king. And so we refer to karma yogis or persons who have attained and continue to perform their duties. I would like to emphasize once again, when we talk about karma yoga in the Bhagavad Gita, we are not talking about karma yoga as in doing some gardening or working in the kitchen in an ashram. That's not what is meant by karma yoga. Here, karma yoga means the highest attainment. One who has become a witness, who is utterly desireless. And he performs all his duties, all his actions without any expectation of reward. All his actions are an offering to the divine. All of life is a yajya, a sacrifice or an offering. And it is that kind of karma yoga that we are referring to. Meditation and action. So we say that if we are talking about such people who have attained the highest, it says senior most one, the term actually used is Shreshta. Shreshta is one who is the best, the superior, excellent one, the best among men and women. So, this is a person who has attained something. He is a role model. We all seek role models in our life. You know, for example, that young people these days seek their role models in film stars, in pop stars, and they aspire to be like these. 
famous, rich, successful. So they acquire such role models. Here we are talking about role models as in a wise person, one who has attained, one who is an inspiration to others. And so those who are like King Janak and others like Sri Krishna himself who has attained, he is a role model for others. So if he behaves in a certain way, the others will look at his behavior. Some may choose to also imitate him and others will aspire to be like him. So Krishna says, I have attained whatever I had to. There's nothing left to be attained, but still I perform my duties. So what does one do? When one has fulfilled all one's desires, you have become utterly desireless. What do you do? Do you indulge in decadence? Do you neglect your duties? What do you do? So it says, I continue to perform my duties. I'm still doing my action even though I have no more desires, nothing is left to be attained. And so he explains further, what would happen if such a person, a role model, would stop performing good action and neglect his duties? Naturally, if you are no role model for young people, for impressionable minds, they will follow your actions, they will imitate you. What will that result in? Chaos. You are setting a bad example. Sri Krishna is therefore talking about those who have attained should be good role models set an example to others and continue to work, continue to perform their duties and actions, not giving in to decadence or selfishness or pure passivity. Verses 25 to 26. O descendant of Bharata, whatever the unwise do, attached to action, that very thing, a wise one, desirous of gathering worldly success, should do without attachment. One should not divert the minds of the ignorant who are attached to action. A wise man who conducts himself joined in yoga should let them learn how to perform actions lovingly. Sri Krishna continues to elaborate along the same theme here. How do wise people behave and how do the unwise behave? The unwise get attached to the action but the wise one will do their action or perform their action without attachment. It says here, a wise one desirous of gathering worldly success. What is meant by worldly success for a wise person? Is the wise person desiring fame, wealth, youth, eternal life, not likely. If the wise person is really having a purified mind, then the wise one desires only the welfare of all of humanity. So 
So such a wise one will continue his action and his action in whatever way will benefit others. It's important that you do not misread or misunderstand that a wise one is now gathering worldly success in the sense of doing whatever he wants. It may happen that a wise person has some desires of his own that he needs to satisfy, but he is able to do so that it also benefits others. He continues to be a role model to work for the welfare of humanity. Such a one would not confuse those who do not have as yet very sharp buddhis. A wise one is one who has a very sharp buddhi. One who is not wise is the one whose buddhi is not sharp. And so, one who is wise would not confuse the others. Are we okay so far? Any questions here or any comments to this? I have a question, Radhikarji. This is Gautam Yam. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so, why is, so, if a person is actually performing his actions uh, to exhaust his uh, past vastnas, but uh, the actions are not are not beneficial to the society, but they are not detrimental also. Hmm. Uh, would, it, would a person be uh, would it be called as a wise person if he is aware of the actions but it is coming out of his uh, tendencies uh, I don't know whether, uh, whether I have been able to uh, uh, put my question uh, uh, yes or, uh, yes I am following your question um, my only concern is that maybe it is a little bit intellectual you know, we are referring here, of course, to the wise ones who have attained the highest state of param vairagya, utter desirelessness. While you are referring to people who may have some desires and are maybe living them out consciously, and that's different. So being conscious and living out your desires consciously or samskaras consciously is a good thing. But here we are referring to that one who has attained a state of utter desirelessness, who is not okay, being, okay. Yeah, who is not colored, his actions are not colored. One who still is living out his uh, own samskaras may have some coloring but one who is a witness that's a different level we must understand that there are many different levels for example we say even within samadhi there are some 10 different levels of samadhis similarly we say that jhanis there are like there are three different states or three levels of jhanis. So there are many fine differences. What we need to know for our understanding at this point of time is that a person is in his or her own way a role model. We are not only referring to a wise person here, though that is exactly what the text is talking about. Sri Krishna refers to great wise ones like Janak. So we are talking about such role models. But we too are role models in our own way. As a parent, for example, you would be a role model for your children. If you teach in a school, you would be a role model for your students. Or if you teach in a college or, or wherever. In your profession, if 
you're a more senior person, you would be a role model for young people whom you're training or mentoring. So in a sense, we all are role models. So we should remember that even in this situation, do not confuse, confuse the others you know, who are not ready. It's a matter of preparation and training. Some of us may know about the, the sage Vishwamitra. He was a famous sage, uh, well known in many of the mythologies. And the reason he was well known was, well, not for good reasons, he was more notorious uh, for losing his temper. He was very uh, temperamental and often lost his temper. So this is an example of somebody who may not necessarily have been a good role model to follow. But Janak, on the other hand, was a good role model. Everybody was terrified of Janaka. He would explode um, and then curse the people. So he was um, not a good role model for, for anybody on the path to follow. Okay. So verses 27 and 28. With regard to the actions being performed by the gunas of Prakriti, jointly and severally, one whose nature is confused by ego believes, I am the agent of action. He, however, who knows the reality of the divisions of gunas and actions, O oh, mighty armed one knows the gunas are interacting with gunas. Knowing this, he does not become attached. So these two verses refer to the three gunas, tamas, rajas and sattva. So I will briefly explain these. Not everybody knows them. This is Sankhya metaphysics. Everybody knows more or less what physics is about. Physics is the study of matter. And in physics one develops theories of how the universe developed, how matter is constructed, what are the building blocks of the universe. Metaphysics goes beyond physics and asks the questions, who am I? What is this universe made up of? How am I relating to this universe? What is my purpose here? And one of the most important aspects of Sankhya metaphysics are the gunas. The gunas are the building blocks of the universe. You can say that the gunas are the equivalent of the periodic table, you know, the different atoms, helium, hydrogen, etc., etc., carbon. And just as these form together to build up molecules, which form complex compounds and create matter in different forms. Similarly, in Sankhya metaphysics, there are three basic building blocks of nature known as Prakriti and these three are Tamas, Rajas and Sattva. So the qualities or quality of Tamas is darkness, ignorance, heaviness, it slows down, it pulls you down, 
These are the qualities of tamas. <clears throat> Rajas, for example, is that which is exciting, which is aggressive, which moves outwards, creates. Sattva is that which is stable, which maintains, which preserves, which has a divine quality. It's light, full of energy, vibrant, dynamic. We all have these three qualities in us and according to the portions or proportions of these make us unique individuals. All of life around us is built up of these three gunas. And these three gunas keep changing all the time. For example, plants have a larger, proportionately larger or greater amount of tamas as compared to animals. Animals have a greater proportion of rajas. Human beings proportionately have more sattva. It doesn't mean we are all sattvic. A person who is very dull, depressed, heavy is more tamasic. Somebody who is very aggressive, outward oriented, you know, is rajasic. And those who are very stable, calm, alert, are more sattvic. As we purify ourselves and allow these qualities in us of tamas and rajas to leave us, we are purified of these, as we become more and more sattvic, we become divine beings. That is what sattva means. We can become divine beings as we purify our character or samskaras in us. So these two verses analyze and explain the nature of the gunas and they explain who is an unwise person and who is a wise one. The unwise, the foolish person, is one who believes that he is the cause of action. Is confused by ahankara. Ahankara takes ownership of all the things that are happening around, while the wise one knows the play of gunas it knows that this is all changing moving of the three gunas interacting with each other and knowing this he does not get attached to anything he is a witness he observes he watches it doesn't mean that he does not act there's action but there's always a part that is very conscious and alert and observant. That's the part which is consciousness in us, pure consciousness. So that's the difference between the one who is wise and the one who is not wise. All good so far? Any questions on that? Any comments? Okay, good then. Uh, it's a good point to make an announcement that uh, today's session is our last meeting. We are going to be taking a break and we are going away for some time, summer break, and we will be back then again only on the 19th of August. This is probably also a good time to tell some of you here, if you're interested, 
that next year, October 2017, we're having a retreat in Rishikesh. So those of you who are interested in joining, you can let me know. I generally, because I generally do not accept people for retreats unless we have already prepared for that retreat. The retreat is quite intense and it's a one week retreat. So if there is an interest, uh, please you can get in touch with me and uh, we can just talk and see if that's the right thing for you. So, 29, verse 29 is quite interesting. It says, Those who are confused by the gunas of Prakriti become attached to the actions of the gunas. One who knows the complete reality should not cause conflict in the minds of dull-witted little knowing ones. So that sounds a little bit um, harsh, perhaps, but this is really the basis of the motto or the, uh, the core idea of the Samaya Shri Vidya tradition. We say, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam means don't impart, don't impart, don't impart. Those who are not ready or not prepared should not be explained or initiated into certain practices or uh, teachings because they will this will only cause needless confusion and conflicts in the mind. It doesn't mean that one wants to keep these people um, out of the secret, you know, there's something so secret and you're not in it. That's not the idea. The idea is that you need to be prepared for that. Some of us who are parents know this, that when the children are very small, the children, they always think, oh, you know, how, how do the parents know? How does mommy know about all these things? So I like to give this example when my our daughter, you know, him and my daughter was young. She was a child of three or four. Sometimes she would sneakily climb up on the kitchen and try to get some cookies from the cupboard. And she would not notice that I could see her in a mirror or in the reflection in the window. And uh, she thought I couldn't see her. And she would be, you know, very sneakily, quietly trying to steal the cookies. And I would say, uh huh, I can see you, I know you, what you're doing. And she would be shocked and she'd say, How do you know? And of course, I would not tell her. I played um, like, you know, mothers know such things. But in a sense, that is how it is for the wise. When the wise have a different perspective, they can see things, understand things with the perception that <clears throat> others do not. And when we try to grasp that, when the seeker tries to grasp these things, he gets confused because he cannot understand it from his perspective as yet. Imagine a mountain, <clears throat> and you're climbing this mountain, 
And maybe somebody is climbing the mountain from the other side as well. But the teacher is right on top, one who has attained, the wise one is right on top. From his perspective, from the summit, he has a perfect view of all the sides. He can see in every direction. From the top, he can guide you. And he can see, perhaps, that if you go further down that track, there, there are big rocks and you cannot cross over. So he may guide you and take you around them in another way. You may think, oh, why are we going the long way? But in fact, he's guiding you so that you don't, are not blocked by obstacles. But for the student who is down there somewhere, climbing up the mountain yet, does not have the overview you can't see quite where you're going. You are dependent on that guidance from the teacher or the wise one on top of the mountain. And you think, oh, what an amazing person this is. How does he know that there are going to be rocks coming down the road that are going to block my path? He knows that because he's higher up than you and he has that wider perspective. So it may appear almost harsh here when we talk about the minds of dull-witted, little-knowing ones. But we require a little bit of humility there, patience, to understand that the idea, don't impart, don't impart, don't impart, comes from the fact that the student needs to prepare, be prepared If you have a child learning math in class 6 and would jump straight to class 12, what do you think is going to happen? He's going to be utterly confused. He simply doesn't know what to do because he wouldn't know all those things. He simply doesn't know them. It's nothing to do with intelligence. It's to do with the systematic learning and preparation. And so when we talk about don't impart, don't impart, secret teachings, people think, oh, I'm being left out. Why am I being left out? This is not because the teacher is on an ego trip and wants to keep you out. Or oh, the teacher is playing power games and does not want to initiate you into some practices. This is because there is a systematic path and we need to go through that. And jumping and skipping the basic steps ends only in confusion, years and years of confusion possibly. That means you need more patience. Okay, any questions there? Radhika ji? Yes. Yeah, Radhika ji, uh, does this also mean that a student uh, should not be sharing his or her experience with other uh, fellow students in the journey? We are preferably not. Uh, one of the reasons is, of course, that, that each person is a different level and one person may not understand the experiences of the other and you can confuse the, the others. But the second reason is you dissipate your energy. You're dissipating your energy. It's just lost that energy. It's better to keep it to yourself. This can be discussed with the teacher. The one who has an overview, a wise one who has an overview, it does not matter if he's not reached right the summit, as long as he's further up on the path and can guide you from there. If you think of it as climbing Mount Everest, you know, they have base camp and then they have, uh, you know, camp level 2 and 3 and base camp 4, whatever. So maybe you've not reached the summit, your teacher may be at base camp 3, as long as you're on base camp 1 as yet, you can have benefit of that guidance. And therefore, 
Do not dissipate your energies. Trying to talk to people who are not ready about such matters. I can imagine where that question comes from, Gautam. Um, most of us have experienced that, that when we get interested in these matters, we find that our maybe immediate family and friends, they don't understand what kind of trip you are on, you know. They think, oh, you're on the spiritual trip now. And um, <laughs> they, they, they find that amusing, perhaps, or they find that silly or weird. or And I think this is a common experience of all those who start seeing these finer, subtler things and are seeking that subtler aspect. And for those people who are not seeking that subtler aspect, they find these things strange and if you are here in the online meeting and discussing the Bhagavad Gita maybe friends and family think hey why are you wasting your time Bhagavad Gita that's for old people you know that's when you're dying or something and you try to explain this and you find that they simply do not understand or they don't want to understand, but that's a common experience that all of us, without exception, have gone through. And that's because in your own way, you are just slightly higher up on that path and you have started seeing things that they don't want to see. That's why I don't quite like the use of the word dull-witted little knowing ones. That seems very harsh because we all go through that process. Once upon a time, we all were also dull-witted little knowing ones when maybe we were chasing careers, money, wanted a house and a car, or wanted family, etc., etc., you know, all the things that one aspires to. And now that we are busying ourselves with the Bhagavad Gita, doesn't make us superior. So it can have that superior kind of arrogance, but it should be taken in the spirit of understanding and compassion because you were there once yourself. You wanted to add something, Adam? Yeah, actually, uh, more than non-seekers, uh, I think I was coming more from uh, you know meeting seekers on the path. Mm -hmm. As well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what does one uh, do in, in such a situation? Uh, non seekers, I can, I can understand. Yes. Uh, you but you also come across a lot of seekers uh, with similar interests or experiences from whom we actually learn and grow yes. on an ongoing basis. So, yes. so I was supposed to. Uh, does, I, uh, does this not mean being a little uh, selfish? I can understand, you know. One needs to be a little selfish to actually attain that thing, but if one is gaining something for fellow seekers, uh, are we supposed to also share uh, our own uh, experiences? Well, supposed to, not supposed to, uh, the choice of um, the verb there is uh, a little bit tricky. Uh, who knows how we are supposed to behave and what we are supposed to do. It, it really uh, is an individual decision or uh, something you need to see at that point of time. It depends on who you're talking to, of course. More important is that when you're sharing with anybody, you're sharing in the spirit of sharing and not in the spirit of uh, a false identity called Ahankara, which is about suddenly playing teacher and very often that is what sharing becomes. For fellow seekers as well, coming from different traditions, different backgrounds, different levels of accomplishment, ends up very often in debates or intellectual discussions. 
As long as the person does not have that overview, if you are at the top of the mountain, or at least close to the top, you have the overview, then you know when to be quiet and sh completely shut up, and when the person is open to receiving guidance. If you yourself are a seeker, you know, then we are talking about the blind leading the blind. So the attitude behind the sharing is important. And the sensitivity to understand what the, that receiver will receive out of that. The big danger I have seen in all these sharings is that they all end up in intellectual discussions and debates. And so my personal experience has been silence is the best way. Keep doing quietly what you're doing. If somebody comes and asks you for your guidance or for your sharing, then share. If nobody asks you, then keep quiet and quietly do what you're doing. Do not dissipate your energy. I'll just continue reading because the following verses elaborate on this subject, which is uh, actually quite a fascinating subject matter. It's a very practical and very useful for everybody. Verse 30, with your mind centered on the self, dedicating all actions to me, free of expectation and free of thought, of the thought mind, fight without the fear of fear and anxiety. Dedicating all your actions to me, me is in capital. It's not that Sri Krishna is being very egotistical here. And, you know, thinks he's very special. The me in capital is pure consciousness. He is not identifying with his false identities. He's identifying with the self itself, that pure consciousness, with Atman. And so with your mind centered on the self, dedicating your actions to the self is without expectation. A form of a ritual, an offering, a ritual offering, free of expectation. Keep on going down this path. Get to know yourself. Purify your mind. Perform your actions fearlessly. This instruction is repeated again and again in the Bhagavad Gita. Almost every chapter he says, Fight. Stand up and fight, Arjun. Almost every chapter. Why does he repeat this? again and again. That is what teachers do. They keep motivating their students. They keep encouraging them. This is creating Sankalp Shakti, motivation, determination. If the buddhi is not sharp enough in the student, which is normally the case, because there is a gap between the student and the teacher, if the buddhi of the student were sharp, then he would not be a student. He would be a teacher. So because the buddhi is still not sharp, because the student is still training, the teacher says repeatedly, don't give up. Keep going. Don't lose heart. The path is not an easy one. It's not easy to look at your own qualities and keep on going through that process, not giving in, you know, not losing heart. We experience this all the time when we have moments when we think, oh, you know, I have, I'm such a bad person. I have so many bad qualities in me. Maybe I'm a pretender. Maybe I'm a mithyachari. Maybe I'm totally fake. And these kind of doubts pour into your, the, the minds of the most sincere students. He says, don't give up. Don't give in to these kind of negativities. Keep going. So that's what teachers do. They keep repeating. Sometimes people ask me, why do you keep repeating yourself? <laughs> you already said that five times already. I say, yes, I have to. That's my job. Because 
Mostly, we don't get it the first time, or the second, or the third. Do you know why, for example, these companies, you know, corporations, they put in millions and millions of dollars uh, into advertising? Do you know why they keep repeating those ads again and again and again? Those commercials? Because people don't get it the first time. You need to keep repeating that thing until it really is such a strong impression that you will never forget. Some of us know ads from our childhood. You can look back and you almost have a kind of a nostalgic feeling when you, you know, think of, um, for some of us from India, for example, you, you, you remember the ads of, you know, the Parley G biscuit with that little child on it you know, or some other ads that are very memorable. Each of us probably connect to certain products because of those ads, those visuals, those, those jingles, because they were repeated again and again, became a part of you. You could not forget it. And that's why repetition is important. For all of you who are serious and sincere, Keep going through these practices again and again. Go through the teachings. Repeat them again and again. Rather than going wider, go deeper. That's what the Bhagavad Gita says. It's not like a flood of water. Instead, dig a well. Go deeper. And he says, verse 31, Those children of Manu, whoever steadfastly, steadfastly follow this teaching of mine, filled with faith and without malice, they are even free through those very actions. Those, however, who are critical and do not observe this teaching of mine, know them confused concerning all knowledge to be mindless who perish. So, it compares those who have found value in these teachings, those children who follow these teachings, who are filled with faith, they will be freed. So, if you find some value in these teachings, you will continue. If you do not find value in them, if you are critical, you will perish. We have a saying in India, or it's a traditional saying, that only a jeweler knows the true value of a gem. To have that kind of eyes, you know, that are well-trained eyes, only then do you know whether that is a real valuable gem or a worthless stone. So we need to train ourselves for that. If you find value in these teachings, you will continue to do them. If you don't find value in them, you will reject them. And those who find value in these things, they have full confidence, they have faith, they have... They know. They have gone through the experience, their own experience, and that's not blind faith, it's reasoned faith. They know that there is something valuable here, something precious. You cannot create a doubt in the mind of such a person. Such a person is prepared. But the one who is not prepared, is not ready, is not appreciating these teachings. As much as you try 
to convince such persons. You cannot convince them because they have not experienced it directly. The result is that if you do try to convince such a person, you will only end up having debates and intellectual discussions. Then it is better you let them be. Don't confuse them. They need to go through that process, that evolutionary process. They need to see it for themselves or experience something for themselves to know that there is something beyond the immediate material world. And this should be without arrogance, with humility, with compassion, with love. Just as a mother is with the child or the parents with the children. They don't understand, especially when you have teenage parents, uh, children. The teenage parents, children think that they know more than the parents. I think all of us have been teenagers and know that to be true. So the teenagers think always, well, I can do it better than my parents. And then they start advising the parents. right? But the parents know. The parents know. They have been there. They have done that. They know that it's okay. What do the parents do? If they are wise, they will not argue with the teenagers. Hmm? They say, okay, fine. Figure it out yourself one day when you yourself are a parent. But not with that arrogance, yeah? out of compassion, loving, because ultimately that is your child. So this should be the stance or the attitude. Not judgmental, not harsh and critical, not trying to convert people like a missionary, but Allow them to go through their own development. That brings us to one of really fine uh, verses in the Bhagavad Gita, one of my very interesting ones here because it debunks the conventional wisdom or the conventional uh, misinterpretations that we hear all the time in the spiritual world. Verse 33 says, Even a person with knowledge acts according to his nature. Beings resort to their nature. What can self-control do? So even one who is wise and has purified his mind Maybe some samskaras left, but all beings will act according to their nature. What is the point of suppression or restraint? In a modern society, we have learned to be very polite and controlled. Yes, to function in modern society, it seems to be important. But is that really helping us on the spiritual path? And if yes, to what extent or how can we go about that? Finding the balance between being authentic and natural and living in society according to the rules of society. So this verse tells us to be authentic. Be yourself. Verse 33. There are attractions and aversions already facing each and every one, every sense, every one, basically. Hemashri, did you want to ask me something or... Was that just by mistake? Okay, I 
I'm just gonna mute you and show you. So there are attractions and aversions already facing each and every sense. One should not come under their control, for they are highway men waiting for him on the path. Better one's own, one's own dharma, even devoid of quality, than the dharma of another, even though well performed. Better to die in one's own dharma, the dharma of another invites danger. A very, very radical verse, again debunking the conventional interpretations of yogic um, people, I would say, because most of the time we are trying to be holy, trying to be yogic, and a lot of people are sincere seekers who have misinterpreted or misguided, think that they have to become something they may follow role models in the sense of imitating them. That's not what role models are for. Don't become an imitation. Be authentic, be yourself. Better to be a crude and obnoxious version of yourself than be a good imitation of somebody else. That's basically what verse 35 says. Be yourself. There are already so many aversions and attractions and so many things. You will be swept away by all these things. In any case, you will be swept away when there are so many things. Why add more? Follow your own dharma. Your svadharma or dharma is your own nature. Don't pretend to be somebody else. Ashish, you wanted to say something? No, I was just uh, thinking that it's uh, it's so easy to kind of stray from one line to another because following Yama and Niyamas in many people's mind can also become, uh, you know, trying to become something else altogether. Yes. And it can very well become a, uh, something about repressing what they are. Yes. Rather than understanding what they are. Yeah. Very well, very well put. Yes, indeed, that is what happens. The yamas and niyamas are very often taught by people in such a way as though they were rules to follow. These are not rules. These are meant for us to observe. Why they call observations? Hmm? They're they not called rules. These are not the like the Ten Commandments. Hmm? Rules anybody can follow. That doesn't make you a yogi. If it were so simple just to follow rules, then all of us would be yogis. All of us would be attained and all of us would be wise. But that is not true. So for those of us who are a little bit more introspective and discriminative, you ask yourself, so if it is not blindly following yamas and niyamas and a bunch of rules basically, then what is it that makes one into a yogi or a wise one? It's the quality of awareness or uh, attention. Attention is just another word for awareness. To be aware of oneself. Learning to... Observe our samskaras and watching them and the yamas and niyamas are framework within which we can operate. So we said, be a role model, but didn't say, be, uh, you know, somebody who just follows rules strictly. Follow your nature. Be natural. But it doesn't say be obnoxious. So where do we find that balance? 
How do we find that balance? That's a skill. As we spoke about the skills of learning to do things selflessly. I said it's like a hobby. You know, if you enjoy walks or you enjoy gardening, it's a hobby. You don't do it for any particular reason. It's not goal-oriented. Everything else is goal-oriented. So if you follow rules, you're just adding more goals in your life. That's not the purpose. It's, it's to be aware. It's to be present. Observe. And be yourself. Be authentic. So that's the balance. That's the skill that we need to cultivate. Any more uh, questions or comments to this? I personally find some of these last verses that we read to be uh, very enlightening. There are many misconceptions of how to behave, what you're supposed to do, rules that people think they have to follow in order to be on the path. And that's not it. Those are just guidelines. And so this can be very liberating. Okay, in that case we can end this session. As I mentioned already, for those of you who join in later, that this session is the last session until the 19th of August when we continue from where we left off. That's right from this point. Uh, we're taking this summer break. We're taking a break and um, we will continue then when we meet up 19th August. I hope. Do we have a session on Sunday? No, I've, I'm cancelling the Sunday session as well because we are having a 